In this chapter, we'll move on to examine the membranes of the cell in much more detail. Membrane structure, as we've already explored, consists of a double layer of phospholipids, with their heads oriented to the outer and inner surface and their tails oriented into the center of the membrane. There are also globular proteins inserted into this lipid bilayer. We've learned that these globular proteins can come in one of two forms. They are either integral membrane proteins, where they're integrated into the membrane, as you can see here, or they're peripheral membrane proteins. They're attached to the outside of the membrane, but not integrated into it. An early model of the phospholipid bilayer portrayed a membrane as a sandwich in which the phospholipid biwit layer was like the meat between two layers of globular protein, the bread. But in 1972, the fluid mosaic model was proposed and revised this model in a simple but profound way. They proposed that the globular proteins were inserted into the lipid bilayer, not as a sandwich on the outside, and that the nonpolar segments of these proteins were in contact with the nonpolar interior portion of the bilayer, and that the polar portions of these proteins protruded out from the membrane surface. This model is the fluid mosaic model. So basically, the fluid mosaic model is a mosaic of proteins floating in or on this fluid lipid bilayer like little boats in a pond. So as we look at this picture, we can see that it seems static, but keep in mind that these embedded proteins are moving around amongst all of these little phospholipid heads. A eukaryotic cell contains many membranes. As we've seen, we have membranes around the nucleus, continuous with the whole endomembrane system and the Golgi apparatus and all the vesicles, and finally, the cell membrane. Each of these membranes share the same fundamental architecture. They have four components, a phospholipid bilayer, which is a flexible matrix, and it's a barrier to permeability. There are also transmembrane proteins in each of these membranes. These are integral, membrane proteins, the ones that are integrated into the membrane. We'll also see an interior protein network. So the cytoskeletal elements of the cell, particularly intermediate filaments, as well as some actin filaments, help anchor some of these proteins in place in the membrane, as well as holding the structure of the cell. Finally, we'll see cell surface markers, things like glycoproteins and glycolipids. Now, all of these pass through the endoplasmic reticulum and then the Golgi apparatus to eventually make their way out in a vesicle to the cell membrane. The ER adds chains of sugar molecules to these membrane proteins and lipids, thus covering them in glycoproteins and glycolipids. And different cell types exhibit different variations of these glycoproteins and glycolipids on their surfaces. These labels act as cell identity markers. Some of them even allow us to determine self from non-self cells. Now we can visualize membranes in a couple of different ways. We can use both transmission electron microscopes and scanning electron microscopes. In one method of preparing a specimen for electron microscopes, the tissue of choice is embedded in a hard epoxy matrix. The epoxy block is then cut with a microtome, which is a sharp, sharp blade, and makes incredibly thin transparent shavings that are less than one micrometer thick. These shavings are placed on a grid and a beam of electrons is directed through the grid with the transmission electron microscope. At high magnifications, the electron microscope provides resolution that is good enough to reveal the double lipid bilayer that you can see below. However, false color has been added to enhance the details. 
Another technique for viewing membranes is freeze fracturing. It allows us to visualize the inside of the cell membrane, so between the phospholipid bilayers. Basically, a cell is frozen in a medium, and then it's cracked with a knife blade. When the cell is cracked, the fracture often goes through the interior of the hydrophilic area of the lipid bilayer and splits the membrane into two layers. Here it is magnified. The plasma membrane is going to separate such that the proteins and other embedded components end up in one or the other sides of the bilayer. Then the membrane's exposed to and coated with platinum. And the platinum sets and forms a replica in the membrane. And the underlying membrane will be dissolved away, and then we view the replica with an electron microscope. So those are just two different ways we might explore the structure of membranes. Let's review our phospholipid structure. After all, phospholipids are the major component of all cell membranes and membrane systems. Remember that it consists of a glycerol, which is a three-carbon polyalcohol, and two fatty acids, long chains. And remember, these could be saturated or non-saturated, depending on whether each carbon has as many hydrogens as it could possibly contain, or we've got some carbon-carbon double bonds in there to create kinky tails. We also have a phosphate group, which is attached to the glycerol molecule. So to review, here we can see the glycerol, which is our three carbon polyalcohol. And here we see our phosphate head, and the third component are our two fatty acid tails here. And we can use a space filling model to show the same thing, glycerol, I mean glycerol, fatty acids, and these hydrophobic tails. So keep in mind that the head, where the phosphate group is, and the glycerol, is the hydrophilic portion of the molecule. The tails that are oriented to the middle are in a hydrophobic region of the molecule. This has implications on what things can pass through the membrane and how they might pass through. So as we learned in a previous chapter, these phospholipids will spontaneously form a bilayer where the fatty acids are located in the center of the membrane here, and the phosphate groups are on the external side of both surfaces. Now this makes sense because after all, the cell and the extracellular fluid are basically water solutions with lots of other stuff in them. So water is constantly trying to interact with other polar molecules, for example, the phosphate heads of these phospholipids, and it doesn't want to interact with the hydrophobic regions at all. So because water is continually trying to act with the heads and the tails want to be away from water, they'll naturally orient in this phospholipid bilayer structure. So in essence, then, it's the hydrogen bonding of water that holds the two layers together. Or you can think of it this way, much like oil in water. Those phospholipid tails that are hydrophobic are so afraid of the water, they want to hide themselves on the inside of the membrane away from water. Because after all, there's an aqueous environment in the extracellular fluid and an aqueous environment in the intracellular fluid, and those phosphate tails want to have nothing to do with that. Keep in mind the bilayers are fluid. That is, these phospholipids are moving around constantly. This experiment to the right is one of the experiments they used to establish that the bilayers are fluid. They had labeled proteins in one cell membrane and labeled proteins in another cell membrane. When they fused these cells using some experimental techniques we don't need to know about, they found that after the fact we had one cell that had mixture of the mouse cell proteins and the human cell proteins. So that is, these mouse cell proteins and human cell proteins migrated around in the phospholipid bilayer.
Now keep in mind, this movement is not uniform all over the cell. We've realized in the past 10 years or so that certain areas of the membrane have more fluidity than other areas. We're not sure why or how, but that's the case. So we know then that membrane fluidity can change. The degree of fluidity changes with the composition of the membrane itself. For example, saturated fatty acids make the membranes less fluid than unsaturated fatty acids. You might recall when we looked at fatty acids back in our macromolecules chapter that they could either have kinky tails or straight tails. And saturated fats had their carbons fully saturated with hydrogen and very little number of double bonds, whereas unsaturated fats had more double bonds and kinky tails. Now, these kinky tails don't allow the phospholipids to stick so tightly together. So the more unsaturated fatty acids there are in the membrane, the more fluid that membrane would be. Most membranes also contain sterols, such as cholesterol, which either increase or decrease the membrane's fluidity, depending on the temperature. Now, animal membranes have a lot of cholesterol in them in order to keep that fluidity. However, plant proteins have much less cholesterol in their membranes. Also, naturally warm temperatures make the membrane more fluid than cold temperatures. Now, bacteria live in a wide array of temperatures. How do they possibly manage this without losing the fluidity in their membrane? Well, a lot of bacteria contain fatty acid denaturases. These denaturases denature the fatty acids and introduce double bonds into the fatty acid membranes. Some genetic studies involving inactivation of that enzyme or introduction of the enzyme into cells have indicated that the action of these enzymes confer a cold tolerance to membranes. At colder temperatures, the double bonds introduced by the fatty acid desaturases make the membrane fluid, counteracting the environmental effect of cold temperature. So now let's take a look at some of the specifics of membrane proteins. The proteins that we find in a cell membrane have a number of different functions. First, they can act as transporters to move substances in and out of the cell. Others may act as enzymes, like these desaturases we just discussed. In general, enzymes are proteins that do things. They have a job to change a molecule in some way from one thing to the other. Some of the proteins will be cell surface receptors. That is, the protein might act as a receptor for some particular ligand or signal molecule that you see here. Some of them act as cell surface identity markers, like this one here, which looks to be a glycoprotein. It's got a sugar chain attached to the protein. This would tell other cells what type of cell it is. Other proteins might work in cell-cell adhesions. This protein is allowing a shape to fit this protein so that literally these cells could snap together, sort of like desmosomes. Another kind of protein might act as attachments to the cytoskeleton. So this protein is interacting with the cytoskeletal elements inside the cell in order to hold the cell in a certain structure or shape. In proteins, the structure relates to their functions. They have many diverse functions that arise from the diverse structures of the different membrane proteins. As you'll recall from our chapter on macromolecules, all these proteins are amino acid chains that fold and coil in primary, secondary, tertiary, or maybe even come together with other proteins to form quaternary structure. The proteins have common structural features that are related to their role as membrane proteins. For example, all receptor proteins will have an active site, a receptor site, for the molecule that's supposed to land there. Some membrane proteins are attached to the surface of the membrane. They're peripheral proteins, and they're attached by special molecules that associate with phospholipids, kind of like a ship that's tied to a floating dock. 
These anchoring molecules are often modified lipids. They have nonpolar regions that insert themselves into the phospholipid bilayer. And the chemical bonding domains that link them directly to the protein that you can see here. Now, integral membrane proteins span the lipid bilayer. They're also known as transmembrane proteins because they go all the way across. They naturally need to have nonpolar regions as well as polar regions of the protein because remember that the phospholipid bilayer has a broad nonpolar region, hydrophobic, water hating region. And if we put a bunch of amino acids in the protein in here that were hydrophilic, they just wouldn't stick. So we need to have hydrophobic proteins. These blue portions of the protein in the center of the membrane would naturally be composed of amino acids that are nonpolar. Whereas the red regions of the protein that we can see outside the bilayer or in line with the phosphate heads can be composed of polar amino acids. So the transmembrane domain is this blue region. Most of the time in these transmembrane domains, we'll see that the amino acids are arranged in helices. You may recall this arrangement from our secondary structure of protein folding. The proteins need only a single transmembrane domain to be anchored into the membrane, as you can see in this protein. However, many of them have many transmembrane domains. Sometimes these transmembrane domains arrange themselves in a circle of alpha helices in order to create a channel through the membrane. Bacteria rhodopsin is one of the key transmembrane proteins that carries out photosynthesis in some halophilic, that is salt-loving, archaean bacteria. It contains seven nonpolar helical segments that traverse the membrane and form a structure within the membrane through which protons can pass during the light-driven pumping reactions. We also may see pores through the membrane. These pores have extensive nonpolar regions within a transmembrane protein in order to create this opening. In this case, we have a cylinder of beta pleated sheets in the protein's secondary structure, again, which we call a beta barrel. The interior of this opening is polar and thus allows water and small polar molecules to pass through the membrane. In the exterior region, we'll see some nonpolar regions in order to anchor it here in the phospholipid bilayer. Now let's see how we're doing with this material by taking a card quiz. Which part of the phospholipid is responsible for the hydrogen bonding with water? So that is, which side is closest to the water? What type of amino acids would you expect to find in the transmembrane portion of a membrane protein? So the portion that is, that's in contact with the fatty acid tails in the center of the membrane. How are transmembrane proteins held in the correct position in the membrane? Is it by covalent bonding to the phosphate group? Or the hydrophobic domain is held in place by some hydrophobic exclusion? Or cytoskeletal elements keep them in place? Or the cell wall keeps the proteins in place? Here are your answers. Yellow, red, blue. If you have each of those right, you're probably ready to move on to the next section. If not, go back and investigate. See what information you're missing. Try to fill in the gaps while your brain is hungry for the information.